Hey guys, my name is Dominic Flex, and today I'm joined with Rod. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, Dom. Thank you for having me here. Uh, well, my name is Rodrigo Flores Soto. I'm an emergency physician. I work in the emergency department of the Hospital Santo Stash. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm also doing a bit of research on uh, artificial intelligence, uh, programmi- pro- programming on the side. So basically, simply put, my job is to keep my patients alive in the ER deck. Yes, right. <laughs> Obviously, most important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what we hope. Um, I really want to interview today because I was really curious about you being, you know, the first line of defense during COVID. You were mm-hmm. working in the ER like you are today. Yeah. Um, what was that like during the pandemic? Because I feel like everything came on quite quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, at what point did you realize that things were starting to get really bad? Um, it was a weird situation because it came out as you said so quickly Mm -hmm. you heard in the news that there were like some cases popping in asia india and like we had some flus before we had sars cov one we had Mm -hmm. the mers we had the swine flu so at that point it was like another flu coming so we didn't get much attention for that i remember at that point i was in my last year of residency and i had tripped a uh uh, i had tripped a hello you (laughs) Uh, a study trip with friends in Guadeloupe. I was leaving the 14th of March, and I remember the day, 12th of March, two days before, after having everything booked, mm-hmm. we received a message for the physician, doctors, and residents that were, we were encouraged very strongly not to leave the country because of this big pandemic that was blowing out. So at that point, wow. we started to like see that things were getting pretty serious. Yeah, when you start to see the lockdown. I spoke to um, a woman yesterday who literally got stuck in Italy yep. for two years wow. because because of that. So it's probably a really good thing that you did listen to that. Yeah, I'm glad it didn't go to Guadalupe. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, and during this time, were there any points where you were actually scared for yourself? Of course, yeah. Uh, I think the first time we realized it was getting serious is when we had this emergency meeting in uh, in my hospital. We were revising resuscitation protocols. You know, when somebody normally crashes in front of you, the, the like the reflex you have, the first thing you got to do is like try to start CPR, RCR, try to resuscitate the, the, the person in front of you. But right now, like at that moment, the emphasis was put the other way around. We had to protect ourselves with uh, personal protection equipment, mm-hmm. with the suits, with the mask and everything because we had to protect ourselves from the virus before helping people that were crashing in front of us. And that was, that felt weird, but we understood because at that point we were seeing young people, young patients like you and me without any medical issue that came to the ER feeling sick and six hours after they were in the intensive care unit intubated and crashing. So everybody was also thinking like, would I be the next? like? Mm -hmm. Would I be the one person in a thousand or less that is going to actually crash or maybe even die from that virus? So you had to be careful with that. And what happens after if like 50% of your staff, the nursing staff or the doctors get sick, get sick, who's going to take care of the patients like the week after? So like the health system could be crumbling through that pressure, that sickness. Wow. Yeah. And I'm sure that the morale was quite low. Like you just mentioned, 40 percent of the staff left or the nurses. Exactly. Exactly. So During those years, so many people got sick. So mm-hmm. many, so much like mandatory overtime was imposed to people that at least in my emergency department, in my hospital, we lost about 40 percent of the staffing. Wow. Yeah. And that's not replenishing today. No, exactly. We're still like trying to reconstruct the teams. And we lost also a lot of experienced nurses that were there for like 10, 15, 20 years. Mm-hmm. So those they do have a big value that has been lost in there. Oh, wow. That's yeah, that's that's really quite scary. During the pandemic, um, do you find that the healthcare, like the government handled the pandemic well? I think they did good. They had a very difficult task at hand that was to their priority was to protect the population in a situation that we didn't know what was going to happen. We had some predictive models, we had some stats, but you cannot predict how a pandemic is going to react. In the same sense, if you come to the emergency department with a big chest pain and you feel sick, my first reflex is going to be to be sure it's not something dangerous. It's not a heart attack. It's Mm -hmm. not a pulmonary embolism. So I'm going to be safe first, run the test, make sure there's nothing critical about that. 
and then lower like the safety measures. And I think that's what they did, and that's what they should have done. Uh, they actually went harder before with uh, in the beginning with the lockdowns, restrictions, and everything. Mm -hmm. And then after they waited, they waited that the virus like all the problems can calm down a little bit, things that are less serious, and then they start like relaxing the measures. Uh, and I think it was a it, it was a good thing to do in that situation. The lockdown, you think that was a good yeah yeah exactly. Okay. It, it could have been worse. It could have been worse. Yeah, and it was kind of weird to see people actually not believing COVID existed. In the same shift, I could see somebody dying from COVID, went to the next patient, and. Like I had patients talking to me about how COVID was a hoax, and I just saw a couple of people die from that from COVID during the same shift. So like it, it was surreal living in that at that moment. But like for that, just how can you explain to somebody who's dying of COVID that they're dying of COVID when they don't believe it's real? Like were they just coming up with other excuses of why they weren't feeling well? Like yeah. how? How can you be so delusional when you're experiencing it? And that's that's the problem. You cannot be rational about it. Okay. It didn't matter how many I tried at the beginning. I tried giving, sitting down, explaining mm -hmm. to people, but nothing was rational about how they thought. They saw videos. They saw posts on Facebooks. Mm -hmm. uh, they saw like in, on, the, on the social media, and they mm -hmm. lived in that little bubble. Yeah, that confirmed their suspicions. They had friends thinking the same way. Mm -hmm. So I was actually the outsider thinking weird stuff and being part of the government plans and everything. So there's there's no way to rationalize about that with somebody, as you said, like kind of delusional about it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. So you were the foreigner coming in being like, this is uh, this is crazy. Uh, this is real. And they're thinking that you're absolutely crazy. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. They thought that I was crazy believing all those hoaxes. Hmm. In terms of crazy, what are some of the cra what are some of the craziest <laughs> things you saw in the ER during your time? Well, in the ER and during my residency, I saw like there, there's a lot of story, like funny stories, sad stories. Mm -hmm. uh, one of like the weird ones we had, I was doing, I was working a more like a psych department, and yeah. I was there for a week taking care of people with like uh, severe depression bipolar people that have been hospitalized for weeks for months at a time sometimes and we came in and at one day one week in morning monday morning and everybody was going like crazy but really crazier than they did before and they were screaming shouting fighting getting naked and we didn't understand how could like all the psych ward get crazy at the same time yeah and until the point we discovered that one of the patients actually had the right to go out of the apartment a couple of hours a day and smuggle crack cocaine inside, <laughs> the, in the, inside the apartment. Yeah. And he actually started selling drugs to everybody. So wow. all these patients that have been working on their mental health for days, weeks, and months, actually everybody crashed at the same time. So let's say the psychiatrist was not very happy about that. Oh my God, what yeah. a disaster. That's really crazy, <laughs> yeah. smuggling drugs into a yeah. psych ward. Yeah, that's probably yeah. not a good idea. It is not. <laughs> it is not. But like, can I ask what no. are the effects of crack cocaine? Like, I don't even know. Like, does it make you very excited or excited aggressive? Sometimes. Exactly. Excited, okay. psychotic, aggressive. It depends on the dose. It depends on the people. It depends on, on a, a lot of things. But normally you don't end well with that. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, I yeah. Imagine. yeah. If um, we go like another crazy story, like COVID related, yeah. uh, I actually had like a patient, like as I told you to you before, an um, intensive care unit that got intubated mm -hmm. from COVID, almost dying, got resuscitated. Yeah. And the day he left the hospital, he was still denying that COVID was the reason he almost died. Wow. Like he didn't believe COVID was real. And in the same team at uh, like I had a, a patient with belly pain he, with a confirmed appendicitis mm. and you can, you can actually die from that if you don't get surgery like in a few days the appendix is going to rupture and you can die from from blood poisoning so okay. you need to get surgery like it's it, or else you die and at that moment during the pandemic you had to be a COVID tested, uh, tested to mm -hmm. be sure you didn't have the COVID so it didn't affect like the surgeons and everything and she refused the COVID testing and I couldn't Ooh. understand why and at some point she's like well 
I, I saw the videos on Facebook. I'm like, what video are you talking about? And she's like, yeah, the microscope. Like, it, they take the, wow. they took the COVID test, looked under the microscope, and they showed us there's nanorobots trying Nano to control our, <laughs> our minds. So the COVID e. testing is issued by the, gov by the government, and they coded nanorobots in there, and wow. they put it in your brain. And they, afterwards, they make the government sound a lot more sophisticated. <laughs> than they than actually they is. Are. Exactly. Wow. There's no way that could be. Oh. And so she actually refused the testing for that surgery that was going to save her life. I, th I think she waited a couple of days and, and came back came and got back. the test and everything. But like at that point, she was ready to die for her convictions based on a Facebook video. Wow, that's yeah. crazy. And like as you as a doctor, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, that must be scary because at some point it's like, can you also be liable, right? Because like, do you have to have them sign papers before they leave? Because otherwise... It, I cannot help patients more than they want to help themselves. Yeah. And if she would have been like intoxicated or psychotic, mm -hmm. at some point it's my responsibility to 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 make sure she gets she does like she gets the proper treatment. But someone talking as clearly like as you're talking to me right now, yeah, I just you can't. I, I just tell her what the risks are, and then she she chooses by herself. Bananas. I had patients patients with uh, heart attacks that in the emergency department that refused treatment they didn't want to get treatment so they just left then why are you there exactly That's really <laughs> exactly because <laughs> they were in pain so oh, wow. but they refused the treatment and they just yeah. leave back and go back yeah. home because they went, didn't want to like sleep at the hospital mm -hmm. yeah. but i feel like that also must have been quite reoccurring with children parents refusing their children to get uh, vaccinated or tested i feel um, like that was probably yeah Vaccina vaccination is a thing, but if a children is like uh, has a life or death medical issue, mm -hmm. then it's a legal case. I can oh, call really? it DPG, and exactly if I am worried about the security of a child, then it's a different game. But for for adults over eighteen, you, you cannot do anything. I cannot force you to stay in the hospital and receive the proper treatment, even though you might die. Wow, I didn't know that. That's uh, I'm actually happy to hear that, that yeah. you can make the decision exactly. over the parents' authority. Uh, in some special yeah. cases, yeah. You can. That's excellent. That's good to know. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the... So that's some of the craziest things you've experienced. What are some of the craziest things clients have... Uh, clients, patients, mm -hmm. I guess it's kind of the same thing, yeah. have asked you? Um, there's a lot of people trying to like abuse the medical system. So yeah. I had people that to diagnose themselves with chronic fatigue that okay. wanted uh, or they wanted like this uh, disabled parking yeah. vignettes so they didn't have to walk that much when they go grocery shopping Ooh. i had people <laughs> who had back pain for like maybe uh, injured young people like without any medical issues mm -hmm. like back pain for two three four weeks and they asked me to sign a waiver as like to to make them disabled for life so they don't have to work for life <gasps> so i had lots of stupid demands like that and like yeah no you go oh back my to god work. Yeah. that's so embarrassing it is oh it is. what are some of the scariest moments you've had to experience during work mm, when i was in red as a residency at some point i think it was a uh, like december 23rd a couple of years ago i uh, was doing rounds in mm -hmm. the hospital and we heard uh Code noir, code noir. So okay. in the hospital, you have a system of codes. Like code blue is a cardiac arrest. Code okay. pink is a uh, children's cardiac arrest. Code yellow is a patient missing that we have to find. But I never heard code black. So I didn't knew what that was. Okay. So I went and looked. And code black is actually bomb alert. Bomb alert. Bomb. Okay. So there was supposed to be a bomb in the hospital we wait for a few minutes and then we hear we get some news uh somebody called and say that they have hidden four bombs in garbage cans all around the hospital mm. so for the next few minutes you're just well what do you there do? yeah waiting for a kaboom or just like trying to work like do you try to evacuate the patients what's happening there or are you gonna blow up in the next few minutes and uh, that lasted for like maybe 20, 30 minutes. And then we received information that that was actually a prank call, a wow. very, very bad mm -hmm. prank call. But for that moment, 
was there going to be like a mass casualty uh, situation? Yeah. Th- that was that was kind of scary. Yeah, because you do see that in the states. I've seen it on the news. Yeah, so it's exactly it's, uh, that it's happens. to be taken quite seriously. But mm-hmm. yeah, no, I can imagine it being very, very, very scary. I mean, because you also, yeah, do you take the patients out? Like, how does that work? Exactly. Like, like the, the, there's a lot of questions going through your mind. I'm sure. Not everybody. Yeah. Not everybody. Uh, so that that was scary. Um, what else? Well, t- you know, working in the emergency department, you see so much crazy stories, so much trauma, so much violence, so much drama. At some point, you get a bit desensitized by mm-hmm. everything because you're doing your job. The yeah. patient that came in with a car crash, horrific wounds, you don't have the time to be anxious. You don't have the time to be sad or stressed. You just, you got to be pragmatic, Cartesian. There's a, it's like, it's mathematics. Like you got a, a problem in front of you that you need to solve to help the people in front of you, but there's something about the code, the code holes, pink codes. So those are children in yeah. cardiac arrest. I think you never get used to that, like trying to revive a kid that is dead or that is dying. There's that emotional toll. Like there's this family, it like right besides like that are scared, screaming, crying. And uh, you remember each of these moments. Like mm-hmm. I remember the time I was trying to revive a little girl that committed suicide and looking eyes with her parents that were crying and they didn't understand why. Like those are big cases that they, they, they stick with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, is therapy a mandatory thing for doctors or no? It's at your own discretion. It is not. It is not mandatory. mandatory. Yeah, okay. exactly. I think I think we do have some resources. Somebody like mm-hmm. don't be, because you you see lots of like terrible things. Yeah. So th- we have some resources. But like at the same time, if you're working ER shifts, you don't really know what you signed up. So yeah, normally you got like physicians that are a bit less stressed, less anxious, able to cope more emotionally mm-hmm. as well. Okay, so it's almost you have to go in knowing a little bit of like a having a certain disposition, a certain personality to go into. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You don't survive that long if you're very stressed or anxious in the emergency department because it's chaos. You mm-hmm. gotta embrace and love and accept chaos at some point. Okay. Yeah. And can I ask then why have you chosen the ER instead of let's say op- opening a private practice mm-hmm. or um, you know becoming more of a family doctor? Is there a reason why? Because it's intense, it's fast paced, and I got mm-hmm. the feeling that this is where I can help people the most mm-hmm. and the, the the fastest way possible. They come with medical issues, and I help them right there. They're satisfied. Okay. It's, as it's as easy as that. Um, I mean, you can never say no to something, but right now, private practice, it's not something that interests me. Even like if some colleagues go there because they have like better quality of life, better hours, Mm -hmm. sometimes better income as well. Yeah. My vocation is in the emergency department where I can actually help people. That's what is gratifying for me right now. Oh, amazing. Yeah. And that kind of ties into something I heard recently from a friend who was studying to be a doctor. He really disapproved of uh, people like doctors going into, you know, um, like plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. He thought that it was very much um a waste of talent and that it should be used their skills should be used for something that's more meaningful do you feel the same way or not at all it depends you gotta be careful because like there's a difference between plastic surgeons doing only aesthetic Mm -hmm. as you said like boob jobs or things like that but the the same plastic surgeon can help a woman like reconstruct reconstruct breast Mm -hmm. after they had breast cancer so they can help a woman feel more feminine afterwards and plastic surgeon will as well like take care of like big burn patients with skin graft so there's a there's quite a there's a, a difference. balance yeah okay exactly. there's a difference of balance in there of course i wouldn't see myself being like a, a family doctor can be can open private practice in aesthetic mm-hmm. medicine yeah it's not something that will fulfill me so yeah personally i would not do that but i i do have friends that go into the avenue and they are very satisfied with that okay speaking of boob jobs i recently saw a girl on tiktok who went to turkey and paid a third of the price for a boob job 
what is your opinion on that? Because seeing that, I just like automatically, I'm like, oh, this was not a good idea. This is not a good move. Don't do that. Please <laughs> don't do that. Yeah. We have a standard of care that is very high in Canada about medicine, about mm-hmm. everything. Everything is super legalized. Everything is super like checked upon. They don't have that in different countries. There okay. are some good doctors in other countries, but it, it's not as regulated as that. So, yes, sometimes people go out of the country to get surgeries, mm-hmm. but I did have lots of those coming back to the ER with infection, with with problems, with and almost dying, actually. Like, if you do a surgery back in Turkey, like, what would the follow-up be like? You don't have a follow-up appointment. Who are you going to call? What doctor are you going to call to, like, yeah. to tell them, like, the... the, the the skin incision looks infected. I don't feel really well. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of complication associated to that. I would say just pay more, but stay alive. Yeah, stay alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, because like also even it's not even just like the follow up, but I feel like I would be so afraid of coming back without a, a kidney. Like <laughs> it, it, it actually you happens like I mean? in Thailand. Like, it, like, it must happen. Yeah, those um, are like true stories. Because you're budgeting somewhere, so they have to make up for it at some point. No, like, exactly. It doesn't make sense. Exactly. I wouldn't, I would not trust that. Like, if I get sick uh, overseas and, like, I can, l- I can, like, stretch the, the time of the operation, I, I, tr- I try to come back to Canada, Quebec. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 100% okay. Sure. Like, when they, you, ha- you check the little fly back option if you're stable. Exactly. Oh, if I'm stable, okay. I would totally fly back. Yeah. Yeah. That makes I wouldn't sense. risk it. Okay. Uh, oh yes spill the tea rod yeah. this is what i want to know amongst doctors mm-hmm. do you guys have some sort of like um sly eye to some of the other doctors like do you see a foot doctor and you're like you're not a doctor is there <laughs> um yes and no i mean they are doctors of the foot they're mm-hmm. way better than me at taking care of foot and it, it's okay so everybody can like like dentistry they're better at me at taking care of they, they are doctors as well so they are doctors yeah okay yeah those one are but sometimes you see on facebook uh that guy who like trained an online certificate like a clinic of neuroscience and tried to realign their chakra and he calls himself doctor and people actually go to him to receive health counseling that is dangerous okay that is very I, i've been some of these like so-called doctors facebook group and what they recommend to patients is is actually it can be dangerous in some situation so Mm -hmm. i I would advise people to be to be cautious of yeah those kind of but pseudo doctors oh 100 percent. that's like for example when roe v wade happened and abortions became illegal i don't know if you saw this Mm -hmm. but on tiktok um all these people started going to tiktok and saying oh you can take these herbs which will induce an abortion and then what ended up happening was all these doctors started coming on and being like don't do that Mm -hmm. you're literally intoxicating yourself to the point that you're inducing you can potentially induce an abortion or like a miscarriage right um but it's so incredibly dangerous because i haven't heard about that yeah people were poisoning themselves Mm -hmm. so i guess it's kind of the same context exactly exactly yeah to, if you want a doctor environment if you want a medical advice you go to a doctor go to a doctor you guys you see doctor. dr rod <laughs> <laughs> love it um okay uh da, 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 da. i just wanted to touch base because montreal well quebec as a whole i feel it's a little bit notorious mm-hmm. for our very long waits you know sometimes you can wait what five seven ten hours in the er why is that is it because we have a shortage of doctors or maybe we're not set up properly? We don't have the right equipment. Like what's going on? Only five to 10 hours. Oh, what those, are, <laughs> those are rookie those are numbers. <laughs> okay. I think the worst I saw last year was like 27 hours of waiting in the emergency department. Yeah, but then at that point they're going in for something that's not serious. Exactly. And right. that is one of my points. Like okay. the, the question you just asked is a very, very like complex question um so why are the waiting hours long in the emergency department Mm -hmm. there's the health system is a very complicated machine an hospital is a very complicated machine and as soon as you you remove like one of the parts working the machine the whole system is going to crumble it's going to go crumbling down um like right now what we see the most is like uh, as i before told you like the the shortage of nurses if you don't have enough nurses in an emergency department 
you cannot run the emergency department. Mm. There's not enough people taking care of the patients. If there's not enough nurses in the hospital, like we cannot, and sometimes they just close, they're gonna close wings of the hospital. So yeah. there's not enough beds. So if there's not, not enough beds upstairs, the patients are gonna stay in the emergency department. So we cannot admit new patients. So every actor in the in the health system is, is very, very important. I remember at some point we didn't have any clerks during the night. So not having clerks during the night means sometimes nurses have to do their job so once again like we're short on staff the machine cannot function properly the janitors during the COVID mm -hmm. when you don't have enough janitors or you see a COVID positive patient and he's discharged goes home but then he has to disinfect everything because if you don't clean mm -hmm. like the bed and the next patient comes in he's gonna get sick with COVID so at some point I remember like we had a shortage of janitors and we couldn't see patients fast enough because they couldn't clean the beds fast enough Wow, so something so silly has e such a big impact. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And there's also the access to primary care physicians. Like people sometimes stay years and years on the waiting list to get a primary care physician. Mm -hmm. So they are they don't have anybody to go to like with their mundane health issues. Yeah. So some people sometimes they try to call get an appointment at a yeah. clinic, but if they don't get an appointment, well they come to the emergency department and they wait. Sometimes they wait 15 hours just to get their medic medication prescribed once again, which is Unnecessary. Exactly. Yeah, unnecessary uh, delays. The time, so uh, sometimes people come to the emergency department and they wait like 15 hours just to get their medication re-prescribed. So mundane things. Mm -hmm. uh, and the problem is the time I'm spending with that patient, I cannot go and look at, like, evaluate and treat a sick kid that has pneumonia. Yeah. So everything gets longer delay more difficult mm -hmm. so but th those are many of the reasons why the hours are so long mm -hmm. and do you think that let's say like pharmacists should be able to almost diagnose these minor problems that these people have to w alleviate the medical system yeah because like if i like mm -hmm. if i have a let's say a uti i mean i kind of know what it is we've all had one at some yep. point right shouldn't i just be able to go to the pharmacy and ask for that medication you know yep. like well they actually do yeah so there's a uh, i can send you the, the link you can put mm -hmm. in your podcast yeah. afterwards if you guys are interested about that yeah. but um they actually do and they can prescribe some medication under mm -hmm. certain com conditions like for the uti if you had yeah. an uti for the in the, like between the the five past years and you mm -hmm. have that medication in your profile they can re-prescribe it once again okay if you have like uh herpes uh they can re-prescribe that as well if you're going on a trip and need prophylaxis f for mountain to uh mountain sickness mm -hmm. or uh, malaria they can prescribe those kind yeah. of things as well but these are all re-prescription right so the so initial time mm -hmm. you'd have to see a doctor mm -hmm some of these are represcriptions mm -hmm. and other ones are you don't need to have the medication in your profile okay. so it depends on the yeah. medical issue and do you think we should push this further or it's not a good idea uh i think we should push it further, further. until yeah. the pharmacist like they can accept and they know their limits mm -hmm. so there are very good pharmacists who when they're not sure they're gonna they're gonna tell the patient to go to the emergency department because what we don't want is to is to somebody somebody have a medical problem that's going to deteriorate at home without the evaluation evaluation of a, a, of a doctor mm -hmm. exactly proper equipment a doctor yeah more exactly. extensive uh, because you can actually have a uti mm -hmm. if you feel sick have nausea vomiting start having fever well that means the uti got to the kidneys and that is now a pyelonephritis and mm -hmm. if it's not treated properly you can die from septic shock okay mm -hmm. so you have to be careful about that so it's a very very fine line and i'm guessing yep. that they would re also require a lot more education yep. yeah yeah 100 percent. okay i see you smiling <laughs> <laughs> i see you smiling <laughs> let's okay. go okay so i wanted to end on a good note yeah um I saw recently on TikTok an mm -hmm. ER doctor and he literally was pulling up scans of, uh, I guess, radiographies of people's insides and real life images of what people were putting up their rectums. Let me tell you, I think people get pretty creative and I would like to know, is this really a thing? Okay, so um, <laughs> the human mind is very creative. Mm -hmm. The human mind and drugs, that is, that is something. Oh, wow. 
So I think a simple rule is if you thought about it, <laughs> it's happened. <laughs> it has been done. Oh, wow. Name it fruit, vegetables, bottles, toys, still turn on toys, anything on in any hole. Oh, it wow. has it has been done. It has been done. And it is this been. always one on one with drugs every single time? No. No. Not always. Just boredom. <laughs> exactly. Sometimes boredom. Um I got one of my colleagues who got a patient who has you know what a colostomy is? No. Nope. So a colostomy is when you need a little bag. Okay. So you got your intestines. Mm-hmm. You don't poop by your rectum, right? Okay. So you need a little baggy to discharge the uh, exactly, matter through, yeah. the, through the abdomen mm-hmm. so you have a little the end of the intestines is, is in your abdomen and you discharge from there and he actually caught chlamydia in there so i'll let you imagine what was happening and we can end on that thanks oh wow okay oh i didn't even know that <laughs> Exactly. All right. So Let's I be got creative. <laughs> Let's get creative. So I have a game for you, mm-hmm. and I want you to tell me if you think this is real or fake. All right. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. I love that game. All right. Christmas game. Real or fake? Oh God. Don't try to cheat by looking at the X-rays. By but, the way. Th- that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's my job. I look at the X-ray. Uh, that one is real. Candy cane. Yeah. Real. Yeah. Unfortunately. Uh, that Very had Mary to Christmas. hurt. That had to hurt. A drill. That's a drill. Fake. <laughs> Correct. That's real. Pestle. Yeah. yeah. Real. What? What is pestle? It's the grind like herbs. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Toilet brush. Uh, yeah, real. Fake. Oh. <laughs> Photoshop <laughs> skills, Daddy. You photo- photoshop them? Yeah, I photoshopped nice. it. Nice. Okay. Mason, Mason jar. In real. Yeah. Yeah. Real. How can yeah. You yeah. This wait. Is- wait until that breaks. <laughs> that this is, is no fun. This is the best ad. This is like an ad for durability. <laughs> it is. It um, is. Next. Glass bottle. It, it follows the curve. I, I would say real. Is it? Real. Yeah. Oh God, that's GoPro. fake. <laughs> that one is yeah. fake. <laughs> yeah, that one's fake. iPhone? iPhone. That one's fake. <laughs> yeah. Real. Vibrator. That Real? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I've seen quite a few like these. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Quite a few. <laughs> they, co- they, 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 they just think about the first step of the plan yeah they just put it in and then you're like oh, oh. shit <laughs> where's plan b <laughs> how do i pull oh, it off no. like people that. use the string method okay yeah. or or just <laughs> or just you don't say use sex toys with stoppers please oh yeah good to know all right rod is there anything that you'd like me to ask you before ending the interview mm, well you touched lots of questions about like the er about the waiting times about the health system and i think our health system at the moment is is sick we -hmm. live in a society that is uh, reactive and not preventive Mm. so we wait until things break and then we fix them up but i think it should be the other way around i think we should be preventive about that i think we should start i think like the most important would be population education like start most of the diseases i see in the emergency department are preventable Mm -hmm. about drugs alcohol cigarette or bad life habits so start to encourage people to move teach kids that eating healthy being healthy doing exercise is cool so i think on the long term that would be the biggest change we can do for having like a, a a positive uh, outcome and the impact exactly Mm -hmm. on the health system like it's all it all starts with education education Mm -hmm. people education like educating people of how the emergency department works what is a valid cause of coming to see me in the ER dep or not what are the resources where can you find an appointment so yeah Yeah. thank you so much for touching on that because i really do feel that i'm sure that a lot of the things that you see are preventative if 
people just learned how to take care of themselves. Yeah. You know, exactly. diet, uh, healthy lifestyle, mm-hmm. exercise. You know, I, I grew up with kids who, who ate pizza pockets every day. Like, yeah. why are these kids not being educated that these are not good health things? Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm actually curious because now that you touched on health, one last question. Yeah. <laughs> Um, because I know a lot of people who have commented that their doctors didn't know anything about nutrition. Mm-hmm. Are the younger generations being taught proper nutrition or it's something that you as a doctor have to research on your own personal interest? We do have some education about okay. that. Mm-hmm. It's not very extensive, Yeah. but we have some basis on that. I think afterwards, it depends on your personal interest, how much you yeah. read on that. But of course, like, it is a, a main pillar of being healthy, eating properly. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you. And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Dom. I hope I don't see you at the emergency no. department. <laughs> no, no. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Perfect. Cool. Thank you.